All right, folks, I want to welcome you all into our compliance forum. This is a series that we do throughout the year. We do four of them. Three of them are of the question and answer variety. We did the lending one uh, at the beginning of the year, a few months back. We did the deposit. Uh, we do these about quarterly. Today, we've got the BSA AML question and answer. And we'll talk more about that here in just a moment. But I also want to let you know that we have a fourth edition coming out in the uh, a little bit later this year, fourth quarter, that is a little different than the first three. It's a look back and then what lies ahead, kind of a giant checklist for the year, and it helps get you reset and uh, where to look in the coming months as we reset for the year that's coming uh, coming in. And so uh, make sure you get your teams registered for that as well. My name's Jared Moyer, and I'm, I'm simply going to do introductions here today. Uh, we've got some other stars on our team. They're going to take care of this today. And so uh, the, the mission is simple today. We're going to get to as many BSA AML questions as we can possibly get to in the next 60 minutes. Uh, we had many of you that took advantage of pre-submitting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're also going to take live questions today, and we're going to mix them all up. Okay, again, get to as many as we can. So as far as uh, the, the people that are going to be on set here today, Kevin Edwards, he's going to be taking the questions and providing the plain English answers. Diane Dean, she's going to be the moderator for today's program. She is the key to getting the questions to Kevin. So make sure you use that Q&A button to get those down. And she'll probably take the really hard ones too, right, Kevin? Um, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and then uh, we've got several people from our team working behind the scenes. We've got Kyla, our training coordinator, taking care of your experience. Amy Kudlachik's back there too. Emily's going to be here. I'm going to be behind the scenes. I know we've got Andy Zavoina. Many of you know who he is. Uh, he's going to be listening back there, and I've, I've probably forgotten somebody as well. But uh, it's a team effort here today to tackle your, your questions and ultimately the answers to them. So with that, Kevin, I'm going to turn things over to you, and I'll see everybody at the end of the program here today. Kevin? All right, let's get started. All right, we're going to start off with monetary instrument logs. If a customer brings in between three and $10,000 cash to purchase a cashier's check, but adds additional funds from an account, so the cashier's check is actually over $10,000, would it still be necessary to fill out a monetary instrument log? Okay, uh, so monetary instruments. A lot of times we, we think of it in the industry as, well, if you get a, a request to purchase a monetary instrument between three and $10,000, you have to complete the log. Um, but really, the amount of the ultimate instrument doesn't matter. Um, uh, if you if you look at what the rule actually says, it's a it's a restriction. You you can't sell either you know a cashier's check or a monetary instrument or, or anything in that category. Uh, if it's if cash is brought in over three thousand dollars, unless you collect this information, and which is why we have the log. So uh, you know, and and we think in terms of well, if it's over ten, we're going to file a CTR. So under what you're describing, I would say, well, it sounds like they brought in a bunch of cash, but not enough to trigger a CTR. So yeah, I would say uh, the 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 ultimate instrument's irrelevant. Uh, you'll still fill out that log because that's how much cash they caught in, they brought in to purchase it. And we actually have a series of questions about completing a CTR on a trust. The first one here, what, if any, are the differences in terms of completing a CTR if the trust is revocable or irrevocable? Okay, well, so really, if a trust is revocable or irrevocable, there's not a lot of a difference there other than how the trust actually operates. Um, revocable means that the, the grantor can actually go through and change a lot of things and they don't have to go to the court or something like that to change it. So now there's a lot of guidance out there on, from FinCEN, a lot of old guidance that's relatively confusing on this. But uh, generally speaking, uh, you treat a trust as a separate entity or separate person. In fact, the definition under the CTR directions includes trusts as a, as a person. So you'll include a part one for whoever's conducting the, the transaction and a part one for the trust itself. So you, you treat it similar to an entity. Now, where might the revocable, irrevocable come into play? Well, with revocable trusts, oftentimes what you'll see is, is sometimes it kind of bleeds into like personal use. And so I, I suppose similar to when you run into an entity where it looks like the owner is actually using the entity as their own personal pay, piggy bank, or you see that bleeding back and forth, well, then maybe you might decide, you know what, we're going to lump these together. And you might even decide you're going to aggregate uh, but but I would say that's more of an exception type situation. So uh, I you know general rule of thumb treat treated just like an entity or a separate entity. How about when should a conductor who is typically a trustee 
be listed as conducting the transaction on their own behalf as opposed to conducting a transaction for another. Yeah. Well, similar to what I just got done saying, you know, we typically we're, we're going to treat them as a separate entity. So they, uh, whoever's conducting the deposit, well, they'll have a part one, but then the entity on behalf of will have a separate part one. Like I said, there might be some instances where as part of your customer risk profile or your monitoring, you determine that, you know, really they're kind of operating as, as a single entity and, and, and you may make that determination, but uh, that I would say that would be kind of an exception to the situation and just document that in your customer risk profile. If a trust has more than one trustee, but they were not a conductor, is there any time that they are included on the CTR as a person on whose behalf the transaction was conducted? Uh, sim generally speaking, no. If they're separate trustees, they're not conducting the, you know, they're, they're not, uh, they're, they're not conducting the transaction. So you wouldn't. Now there is some old messy guidance back in 1995 uh, or 19, mid 90s where uh, FinCEN, it was very confusing. It kind of laid out the, a circumstance where you might have an additional part one for like a, a secretary who comes in and conducts a, a transaction on behalf of the trustee. And so you could have it under those circumstances. But uh, but again, that guidance has actually been pulled down and it's pretty rare. So I would say under, under normal circumstances, no, you probably wouldn't see that. Uh, again, unless you have additional knowledge. And to close out the questions on CTRs on a tr and a trust, do any of these answers differ if the transaction is cash in versus cash out? Um, not, not under the typical rules. Now there are some rules. You may have an account that's set up that's joint for whatever reason or something along those lines, which would be really unusual. Um, uh, but yeah, for, for the most part, no, they cash in cash out. It wouldn't really make a lot of difference other than those standard rules for your CTR. Okay. Moving on to a policy procedure question by law or regulation, what are the minimum requirements for what needs to be included in a BSA AML policy? Ooh, well, that's a that's a pretty loaded question, but uh, the the policy itself you need to you need to at least make sure that you're directing what the uh, what what the pillars of your program are going to be, and then the rest of the details you can flush out in a procedure. So you know the pillars consist of things you need to set up at, at least direct that there's going to be internal a system of internal controls that manages your compliance in general. You're going to have a a, a BSA AML CFT officer that's going to be appointed. You're going to have uh, testing or independent testing that you're setting up. You're going to have training. You're going to have a customer identification program or a customer due diligence program. But really, rather than go through all of the technical, legal, and regulatory requirements, uh, I just encourage you to check out our website. If you go to our store and and look for, and search for our free tools, uh, and I believe they're going to maybe if we could have somebody drop a link into the the chat so you can you can go there directly. We actually have some free tools. Uh, one of them is a high level lean and mean BSA policy that has those minimum components. And then there's another document that's for free in the store that lays out the minimum components that you need for your procedures. And that, that gets into more of the moving parts of what, what all those minimums are. So rather than listing off a laundry list, I just encourage you to check that out. Um, the other thing, though, uh, keep in mind, we have a new proposal that's going to update some of these minimum requirements. And so that's the, these things aren't set in stone. So uh, if you're looking for minimum requirements, just know that these things change over time. You're never going to just nail BSA AML. It's something you're going to be constantly updating. And uh, uh, so, so under that new proposal, uh, we're probably going to be tweaking these at some point in the future. The nice thing about getting these documents from our store uh, and downloading it uh, is we're going to send you an email once we tweak them for all of these updated requirements. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, probably quicker to do it that way than list it off here. And just to clarify, how should procedures be employed? Do you recommend within the policy or as a standalone document? You know, I would say keep your my my advice is always keep your policy as as lean as possible. Um, the more you start getting into procedural elements, 
Um, first off, you got to train your board on all of that. Your board can't approve something that they don't really understand the moving parts of it. Uh, then you also need to worry about, uh, you know, if you if you have a violation, you just have a procedural problem and maybe somebody didn't follow procedure. That's one level of problem. But if you have a policy violation where they weren't following policy, that, that kind of ratchets things up. So generally, I say, you know, uh, hit your main components hard with your with your BSA policy and then flush out all the details at a procedural level. The other benefit of that is if you as a BSA officer need to tweak a procedure or you need to update something over time, uh, it's a lot easier to tweak a procedure than it is to call a board of directors meeting and, and actually go through a policy change. So it, it, it get, makes you a little more nimble uh, managing your program. So that, that's my two cents worth. Hey, we have one on marijuana related businesses. Do we need to be filing SARS on employees of marijuana-related businesses? Employees. Okay, so one of the most frustrating things about the uh, marijuana-related business guidance that we have from FinCEN is that it speaks in terms of marijuana-related businesses, but it doesn't address individuals. Um, now, a couple of things. It also speaks in terms of transactions, and it says uh, pretty clearly that the SAR requirements are unaffected uh, by the guidance or by the, the changes in laws that are out there related to marijuana. So you still have a responsibility if you detect transactions that are likely to be the proceeds of the sale of marijuana. Remember, the sale of marijuana is still illegal at the federal level. So those proceeds, it would be illegal to uh, intercept those proceeds or transact on them. So technically that SAR requirement is there with the proceeds. So if you are if you believe that the payments to that employee are likely the proceeds from the sale of marijuana, then technically that triggers the SAR requirements. Now, all of that being said, I have also heard that there are uh, regulators and, and there's been some unofficial advice from FinCEN directing financial institutions to really just manage this with their program and, and, and write out exactly how they're going to treat this on a risk-based level. Um, but again, that's unofficial guidance. So you really have two, two approaches here. The conservative route is, yep, if you have an employee and they're going to be receiving those payments, those payments are likely the tra that transaction is going to be from the proceeds of the sale of marijuana. Then you file that. Uh, I, I would say that's when you would want to do the marijuana limited SAR. Um, otherwise, you have to develop your program and, and explain exactly why you're doing it and why it's appropriate at a risk base risk basis. But there really isn't any guidance to hang your hat on if you're going to do it that way. So uh, again, it's a little frustrating, but uh, you know the, the guidance is, has a little bit of a gap there. Okay, how about one on OFAC? Are you okay. hearing of criticism for not checking OFAC until after account opening? Uh, well, if you think about OFAC, yeah, I mean, yeah, OFAC is kind of a grand thou shall not transact or allow to tra transact to anybody on that specially designated nationals or block persons list, right? So it's a thou shall not exercise and, and you have to have a program uh, that's going to make sure that that doesn't happen. So if if you are um, not checking OFAC until after you have the accounts open, that's a pretty easy criticism for an examiner to make. And, and yes, I have heard financial institutions criticized for that. Now, is there a direction that says that you must do this before the account open? No, um, it's just clearly a best practice to make sure it gets done before that account, or, or especially before there's any transactions on that account. Would any account that has been opened for an insurance company fall under the non-bank financial institution definition? And what recommendations do you have for reviewing these accounts? Well, an, a non-bank financial institution is a very broad definition. I mean, typically it's any, you know, non-bank entity that's that's carrying out bank-like activities. And there's there's a laundry list of examples. Um, but typically under that very broad definition, insurance companies are included. So I would say, yes, they would be, they would fall under that definition for the most part, unless there's something really weird in what they're actually doing. Um, but it, it's a very diverse group of companies that fall under that definition. And if you go to the uh, the the guidance that's out there, it's it's very broad. 
Um, but really, ultimately, what you'll need to have is you'll have to have enough information so that you understand your customer and that you understand the types of transactions and the relationships they have. So you'll need enhanced customer due diligence so that you can know the nature and purpose of that account. So you may need to uh, find out you know, what types of uh, relationships they have, what types of customers they have. Really understand that business model so that you can look at the account and be comfortable that the activity you're seeing is uh, is is not high risk or it falls within those expectations. So uh, again, that that the guidance for the non bank financial institution is very broad. You don't find a lot that's specifically on insurance companies. Uh, but really, that all underlying trigger is yes, you probably do need to have enhanced customer due diligence for that entity. It just needs to be tailored uh, to 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 their particular risk profile. When filing a CTR, when cash out is from proceeds of a loan, does the CTR include the account number? Uh, if it's the proceeds from their own, that yes. And uh, usually you put the loan number in there and uh, you check that box, I think at 35, that it's, a, it's an advance on a loan. How about does it make any difference on whether or not to include the loan number if the institution puts the proceeds in the customer's account first and then the customer immediately goes to the teller and withdraws it? Right. So the proceeds go into the account. Uh, you know, I've seen this done both ways, but uh, typically if the cash from the loan goes into the account and uh, it, it's it's pulled out from the account by the uh, uh, the customer, usually that's the point when you say, OK, we're going to call this a withdraw, um, particularly if, if it's not automated. In some cases, maybe you have it hit the account, but it's really more of an, uh, an, an accounting or formality thing, but they're getting the cash Maybe you'd do it the other way and, and cite the loan. But uh, under most circumstances, I would say, yeah, you put the proceeds into an account and then they made the decision to go today and pull it out from that um, DDA account. And so that's that. then I would include that DDA account. When completing a SAR, does part two, number 48, for the product or instrument description relate solely to a commodity being involved? And they're saying they've seen it uh, they've seen someone say that it includes any checks involved and they just want any clarification. Right, right. The so the if you if you go to the instructions on this one, uh the instructions do say that the, it references back to any responses that are in those sections uh 39 and 40. So at the top point, and that that's talking about insurance uh related issues and commodity. So just going to the instructions, I would agree. Um, anything additional should go into the, I mean, that would probably go into the naked into the narrative. Uh, but for for the SAR itself, the only time it's required is if you if you if you check some boxes under under 39 and 40. Okay, this next one, uh, they had a customer receive a tax refund in someone else's name. It was an ACH and some funds were withdrawn, but the institution is thinking this is a scam and froze the funds. They've contacted the IRS and FBI, but are struggling to get any action. Do you have any advice on who we can contact to let them know that the majority of the funds have been frozen? Mm. Well, oftentimes you find that the uh, federal agencies aren't a lot of help. Um, it, it puts you into a tough situation because you've frozen these funds and, and you've got kind of a clock ticking. So uh, I know some financial institutions have gone to local law enforcement to get a little bit of help. You can reach out to the other financial institution maybe and see if you can get some clarity. Um, I know some financial institutions have actually gone through an attorney uh, to bring those funds to the court and, and, and basically say, we, these aren't ours. We don't know who they belong to. But really, ultimately, you're putting yourself into the middle of something, especially as time plays out. You might be opening yourself up to, to um, potential legal liability. So I don't want to touch on that too much. Uh, but ultimately, I would say it sounds like this is a pretty high risk account, high risk customer. You'll probably, you know, already have filed your SAR, but it might be something you think about going forward, you might close that account. So uh, if anybody in the chat wants to comment on, and if you've ever gotten traction on a similar situation, go ahead and give them some advice. But I know it it, it kind of depends on the circumstances and the type of agencies you're talking about and uh, really the specifics of that uh, that transaction. So uh, it, it, does, it does get kind of tough. This next one is on 314B, wondering if we're seeing more institutions registered and are we hearing of any criticism of institutions that are not registered? 
you know, they they kind of with some new guidance, they kind of rebranded three fourteen in uh, you know three fourteen B, trying to make it sound like it was uh, it was going to be less of a burden. Uh, I know a lot of financial institutions when it first came out, it was just something that they could potentially get wrong. So a lot of them were like, no, well, I'm not going to do something voluntarily that I can only get wrong. So we just won't do it. Um, but that that rebranding really kind of illustrated how, look, we're not trying to, we're, we're, this is a useful tool. A lot of the uh, uh, the new fence and guidance references it over and over again as a useful way to kind of mitigate your risk. So I am seeing more financial institutions that that didn't do it originally are now getting into it, um, particularly when you look at some of the higher risk guidance. If you have uh, some higher risk customers, like maybe your maybe your banking marijuana related businesses or something along those lines, um, then it's very clear. They, they they make it very clear that that's one way you can help mitigate your risk is by sharing information along those lines. They don't break down how some of this guidance actually doesn't mesh up with the purpose of 314B, but I'll leave that alone. Um, but I am seeing more. I have not, though, seen a financial institution that was criticized for not having it, though. So uh, again, on one end, yes, I am seeing more and more financial institutions get into it, um, but I'm not, I haven't seen specifically that someone is criticized for not doing it yet. What information or guidance can you share regarding incorporating our loan department into our BSA AML program? Okay. Well, I, I would say you definitely want to make sure they're incorporated because they are uh, your eyes and ears on the ground. Your loan officers are actually gathering a lot of the information that's vital for CIP and your customer due diligence and really creating probably your customer risk profile. So um, part of it is to remind them or in your training, make sure that they're aware of what a vital part they play, um, that it's not just with new customers that they're gathering information on, but it's also ongoing through the course of the relationship. And so make sure that they're aware that they may encounter some triggers. Uh, you know, maybe something has changed with a current customer that might indicate that the, you know, they may have a higher risk profile or trigger some additional um, due diligence or evaluation. So I would say high level, just make sure you get everybody on the same page and remind them that not only are they part of the BSA program, but they're actually a really important part of the BSA pro program because the BSA department can't do all things all the time. Um, so I would say that that's usually a step. And when I when I train on on it for for lenders specifically, I, I try to make sure we ring that bell pretty hard because it's uh, um, they are a vital piece of all of this. And uh, there's only so much that your BSI officer can do. For marijuana related businesses, do you anticipate any changes or updated guidance when it comes to SAR filing requirements? You know, I, I certainly hope so. Uh, but that being said, I've had my hopes dashed a few times where uh, it looked like we were getting some traction and they were going to give us some meaningful guidance or updates. Uh, and then it goes away. So I would say uh, right now, as things set uh, currently in in the, 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 the politics of the world, it doesn't look like we're going to get a solid change through Congress um, it maybe with the, a, a change in administration or change in the makeup of, of Congress, that, that might be something that gets through eventually. Uh, and I haven't seen anything where FinCEN is going to, um, you know, update uh, the, the current guidance that we have. So while it's always a possibility and I could be proven wrong tomorrow, um, at, at this point, it's, it's one of those, God, it would be really nice to have. Um, but I haven't seen anything specifically that's, that indicates that it's coming. If the owner of a strip mall has a tenant that is a cannabis store, does a SAR have to be filed continuously because they are receiving rent payments from that store? Um, yes. It's be, since the funds that are coming in that are a rent payment, uh, those are likely to be the proceeds from the sale of marijuana, then yes, now that, that landlord who's receiving those rents are receiving those proceeds. And so they will technically meet the definition of a marijuana-related business. Uh, and so you'll have to file a SAR and, and probably have some enhanced due diligence to continue to monitor that as well. We have a couple of questions on the beneficial owner certification on the beneficial owner certification form, is the use of a title such as manager okay? Yeah, if you look at the form itself, it, it really asks for name and title. 
Uh, and then whoever's filling out that form is going to be signing off that it's accurate and up to date. So whatever whatever information they provide to you, that's what I would put. So, you know, they, they could be the grand poobah of all things and whatever whatever title they put on there, I would say that's perfectly acceptable. So can the certification form be dated after account opening? Um, technically there isn't anything I think that specifically says that's a problem. You're supposed to do it at account opening though. So it, it maybe you might have a time lapse there, but uh, really it's a, it's, it's kind of a bad process. Uh, you know, e even if it's just a slight delay or something along those lines while you're gathering the documents, um, the reg says at account opening, um, it's a really tough process though once the account's open or the money has gone out the door to go back and try to get some of this information or documentation that you have so um, while you might not be cited specifically just for having those days not matching up perfectly um, it still indicates that you might have a flaw in your process and you could run into some troubles if you have to go chasing people down after the account's opened or after the loan's been made on a continuing SAR, is there a threshold? For example, does the continuing activity need to reach five thousand dollars? Okay, okay. So um, this one's this one's a little confusing because if you look at the requirements, uh, you know, in the directions, uh, it says you know a continuing report should be filed uh, if you if you detect continue the continuation of that suspicious activity that triggered the first star. And there's no reference to a threshold and if you look at the, the directions. And some regulators and auditors have interpreted it that way, that there is no threshold. But that being said, I've also seen that FinCEN has given unofficial responses to financial institutions that have said, no, that there is a threshold for, you know, after you do your 90-day review, and uh, you look at the activity during that period and it's below the, the $5,000 threshold, then any SAR would be voluntary at that point. So uh, again, that's, so there, there's kind of a, you know, there, there's, a, there's a little bit of a dispute that's out there on that. Um, I would say it's, if you are going to take the, the route where we are not going to file a SAR, I could probably defend you if you say, okay, it's below that threshold, we're not gonna file it. Um, but again, I don't have anything I can really hang my hat on. Um, the instructions say, uh, if you detect continuing activity that triggered the SAR, then you should file that continuing to SAR, and there isn't a threshold reference. And then even if you weren't going to do it, you would have to document exactly why you didn't file that SAR and, and in the conclusions of your review. So um, I've seen it done both ways. One is just a lot easier to defend. We have a couple of questions re with related to training. Do you have any tips for getting a new BSA officer up to speed? Ooh, yeah, that's that that that's a that's a tough situation. It, it really depends on who your candidate is because your BSA officer has to know a lot. Now, now, I mean, high level, yes, they need to know the law and the guidance of the Bank Secrecy Act and all and and everything that comes along with that. So you'll need to get them specific training on that and specialized training. Um, but then there's also the other components that a BSA officer has to be a master of. They have to know how the financial institution works. They have to know how policies and procedures work in your, your institution. So getting them up to speed on understanding your management process and who your board of directors is and how that all works, um, that's a whole nother thing that they have to digest and then the, the the third element is that, you know, well, if they're conducting the investigations, they also have to think like a criminal. I mean, you can you can know the Bank Secrecy Act and the guidance and the technical requirements all day long. But when you're investigating, you have to really think through, you know, what are what it, what does money laundering look like and what are criminals out there doing? So then you would need to really dive into case studies and things along those lines. In fact, sometimes a new BSA officer, when they're really confused, I'll even recommend watch movies or TV series about money laundering like Ozark, just so you can kind of see how it works. So you start thinking along those lines. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of different elements. I would say those three are the ones that you want to make sure that you hit. We provide all new employees an overview of BSA requirements. Should job-specific training occur at this time as well? You know, uh, it depends on the the employee. But uh, to be honest with you, brand new employees they're they're drinking from a fire hose. They're getting so much information thrown at them just to do their jobs. 
Um, so I would say high level, you know, concepts are probably a good start to let them know that this is your responsibility and that you're now part of the team. And these are the things that are going on um, to build on with, uh, you know, maybe specific position, specific uh, training later on. I would just say if you're not including it in that new hire training, you would want a pretty fast follow up. So, you know, let them get those concepts and then move into it after that. So. Hey, can I chime in for just a second? Kevin, sure. there was a question, um, probably two or three back. I had to go do my research because I didn't recall the answer off the top of my head. But you were talking about beneficial owners and the mm-hmm. certification and the verification. And um, I just wanted to clarify the certification, the identification of who they are, that has to be done prior to account opening. It's the right. verification that can wait 30 days just to make sure everybody's got right. the, the full answer there. Right, because the verification is where you have a little bit more time, and that that's where we usually see the lag is in the verification process. That's right. But as you stated, you lose all your leverage once you lose the once you've opened up the account. So I would do right. them both for. And just I'll throw this out there: there's going to be some confusion coming all y'all's way as it relates to 1071 and beneficial owners. Um, if you haven't caught some of that training from us. Um, you're going to want to get your BSA, T- BSA ML people in the same room as the 1071 people because those things sound a lot alike, but they are not exactly. They're alike. not the same. Yep. Yeah. You're, that's a, that's another coming attraction for that BSA uh, conference. We'll get into that. So, <laughs> All right. Virtual currency. Do you have any tips for what to look for to identify suspicious activity linked to virtual currency or any resources to stay on top of the latest information? You know, it's it, it's really tough. We do a webinar on, on virtual currency every year and we try to, you know, bring some of that new learnings because it's a field that is developing faster than the regulations and the guidance can keep up with it. So it's it's really uh, disjointed to go through and try to figure out, you know, okay, so what are we supposed to be doing as of today? Um, information's all over the place. Uh, but really what I would say is, is focus on what you are seeing. So do an evaluation, figure out what types of virtual activity or virtual currency transactions, which exchanges are, are you dealing with and start there um, rather than trying to figure out everything that's, you know, on that, that front bleeding edge of the sword, what's the newest out there. Um, take a, take a look at what you're experiencing and what types of customers you have and what types of activity you're seeing. Um, and then, and then research it from there. Would you recommend treating crypto ATM owners similar to other private ATM owners, or are there special considerations we should take into account? Yeah, well, well, first off, you know, definitely I would start if you have ATM enhanced due diligence procedures, that's a great place to start. But you do have to recognize that uh, typically, you know, those virtual or crypto ATM kiosks, they're inherently higher risk just because of the nature of the type of business that they're in and, and that we we know that they are uh, not only often used for money laundering, but some of those services and some of those uh, um, you know exchanges that they're dealing with have actually been uh, set up as a method of of money laundering. So you'll you'll definitely the similar concepts apply. You just need to understand these are higher risk, and you might be looking at different factors. Uh, but if you have one of those crypto ATMs, you know where is it located? Uh, you know, is the customer getting paid to have a crypto ATM on their premise? Uh, does the location make sense uh, where it's at? So you'll you'll ask a lot of questions on the front end, but ultimately, what you're trying to come down to is uh, an understanding of why that device is there, how it you know how it operates, and then. Uh, making sure that you're comfortable that that's legitimate activity. With wire transfers and the travel rule, is it required to document the street address of our customer or is a PO box sufficient to document on the wire as long as we have the street address on file in our system? Okay, so the the term address isn't defined uh, in that in the particular travel rule there, but uh, there is some guidance out there that uh, suggests that you can use a PO box or a mailing address so long as you do have that physical address and that it's retrievable on request if law enforcement ever comes to you. So for that particular rule, 
Um, you know, if your system, like a lot of times what happens is your system automatically generates the mailing address, not necessarily the physical address from your um, your customer identification program. Um, that what, what they've said is you don't have to figure out a workaround for that. Um, as long as you do have that physical address and that you can provide it to law enforcement, you should be fine. When we file a continuing SAR and are filing for the third time, what is the prior report BSA identification number we should include? Is it from the original report or the second report? I've actually seen this done um, both ways, and there isn't a lot of clear guidance on how that's that's supposed to work. In fact, if you look at the uh, the instructions, it just references the prior report. Um, you know, after that 90 day review. So um, I, I've seen this done both ways and I haven't seen a financial institution that was cited one way or the other. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear that if you cite to the previous, the immediately prior report that fits the definition as well. And there really isn't anything. In fact, you are allowed to submit additional report numbers in, in that field. Uh, so if you wanted to include additional ones, you, that would be fine as well. This next one takes us to the subject of fraud. Do you have any advice for dealing with customers who you fear are caught up in a scam of some sort, but they are adamant about sending money? Yeah, and oftentimes the uh, the, the fraud schemes they're they're set up to uh, make them not trust their uh, financial institutions, so they're they're coming through the door not buying what you're selling, um, and that's just part of the scheme. Uh, but oftentimes, I've seen, you know, reaching out to social services, maybe there's family members or close family members that you can identify to reach out to um, law enforcement, uh, it, particularly if it's an elder financial exploitation situation, you really need to know what your reporting requirements are. Um, but uh, yeah, ultimately, you know, if you can't stop it, uh, then the question becomes, look, OK, uh, there's nothing that says you have to facilitate this kind of illicit activity. Um, so you may come around to the conclusion that, look, we're going to we're going to tell them you need to stop doing this or we're going to close your account. And uh, that's that's perfectly legitimate response. Back to virtual currency, what kinds of thresholds should we use to determine whether customers who are transacts transacting with exchanges be investigated? Ah, well, there there isn't any specific guidance that says at a certain threshold you need to have any triggers or red flags. Uh, so that could vary from institution to institution or, or customer to customer. Um, a, a good starting point uh, might be really looking at what type of activity you have and what you're experiencing and then figuring out, you know, what is your resources? I mean, how many resources do you have to actually monitor that kind of thing? So, you know, it, it's supposed to be risk-based. Um, so if you're a small institution, maybe you can look at every single relationship or every single um, transaction even. Uh, but a larger institution, you probably, you know, you might have to whittle it down some way. Um, setting thresholds internally to um, trigger red flags, things like uh, maybe at a, at a certain amount, um, you know, then then it'll trigger a red flag and you'll take a look at it. Or maybe it's a percentage of the account. So if there's transactions that are over a certain percentage of the total amount in the account, um, that might be a trigger. Uh, you have some flexibility on how exactly that looks, but I, I would say high level, it, particularly if you don't have any software that, that's helping um, evaluate that for you, start with a logical uh, approach based on what you're actually seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. And just know if you want those red flags, it should be something that's that's outside of the normal of what you're expecting. Once FinCEN's beneficial owner database becomes available, do you foresee institutions seeking access to it even before we may be required to do so? Yeah, I think it's definitely possible. Uh, in fact, I, I think there are financial institutions are figuring that out right now. Uh, so the the reform for the beneficial owner rule, there's, there's three basic steps. First one is setting up the database, which is what they're in the process of doing, and they're kind of in some legal uh, battles on how that's going to work out, but it, it's getting that database set up. Then there's going to be the access rules, which they've already released. It's it's how would a financial institution um, appropriately request information from that database, uh, and then eventually 
we're going to get our new marching orders on, on how we're supposed to utilize that database or not. So I know some financial institutions are looking into setting up uh, that request process and making sure that they have that in line. Uh, there isn't anything right now that says you have to do it. Um, the key is if you are going to access that database, you need to understand what those requirements are and, and also know that your regulators will have access to it as well. So if you're accessing it and the, uh, the maybe maybe your information doesn't match with what the database says, that might be a trigger for you to go through and figure out, OK, why do, why doesn't our information match up with what the database says? Um, regardless, though, once once you have that access, though, I think there could be triggers for you to act because that's the normal course of business. If an individual states they're trying to avoid CTR or re record keeping requirements, should item number 23 or the corroborative statement to filer be completed as yes? Um, yes. So, I mean, if, they're, if it looks like they're, stru they're structuring and, they, and they've said that they are, then that's illegal activity. And so then, yes, if they've corroborated that and said that that's exactly what they're doing, uh, that, I think that would be an appropriate circumstance to, to check that box. Do you recommend filing a SAR even if we're under the required filing thresholds? Not, not really. I don't know if I'd recommend it because I, I know um, we have been reminded a number of times that uh, you know you, that you don't have to file a SAR if it doesn't meet those thresholds. So it, it's very clear that you don't have to, but you can if you want to. So I would think uh, you know there, there, if you believe in the course of your investigation that there may be information from that SAR. Uh, that might have additional, um, you know, facts that might help law enforcement or something along those lines, um, then, you know, feel free to do so. But I, I wouldn't say there's anything that really says you have to. Th those thresholds are out there for a reason. So do you feel it's okay to file under the thresholds on a case-by-case -case basis, or should we be consistent? I, I, I think under these circumstances, normally I say consistency is key, but I, I think because SAR filings are so inherently subjective, um, then you're perfectly fine doing it at a case-by-case -case basis. Just, just document your logic for why you are or are not. When it comes to our independent test, are you aware of any institutions being criticized for waiting longer than 12 months between? Do we need to be able to demonstrate that our overall risk went down? Well, I mean, I, I have seen financial institutions that were um, criticized, but it wasn't necessarily, uh, it, it was really because they had a, a lockdown in policy on how, when they should have their independent test and they were outside of that. Uh, so, you know, that sometimes that happens and it depends. Maybe it's just a scheduling problem and your policy says 12 months uh, and it goes a little long because you just couldn't get that independent test scheduled. Uh, and, and that's fine. I would say approach that in advance, bring it to your management team or your board, um, let them know what's happening, let them make the you know conclusion that, well, this won't affect our risk profile by delaying this a few months and have management sign off on it. And then I think you're probably okay. Um, but, uh, but if you're, you know, particularly high risk, and, uh, you know, or maybe there's some new changes to your program or or maybe you had a previous exam or an independent review that had some issues that you're in the process of checking. Well, then I would say don't don't wait on it. Get it. You know, make sure you're getting it done, uh, you know, in, in accordance with, with what your risk assessment has laid out your time frame to be. For our beneficial owners, can you provide examples when we should get an updated beneficial ownership form outside of account opening? Okay, uh, yeah, really anytime you detect a change in the beneficial owners that you have on files, um, so maybe it was a sale of the company or maybe they brought in a president and uh, they now they've got a new president and the person who's identified as that significant managerial control prong. Um, if that has changed, you know, that's that's a trigger. Then you would go out and you would you would gather that information. And and it's anytime you encounter that information in the general course of business or in the course of your monitoring, um, that's that's what would give you the responsibility to update it. When it comes to our BSA staffing, is there any possible way to tell that we're adequately staffed? 
You know, it, you know, if you're at that, that's, a, that's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing to figure out because, uh, you know, you have the staff, you have the, the, um, you know, what's on your plate at any given time. The question becomes, are things falling between the cracks? Um, just because people are either wearing too many hats or they're too busy. Um, are there known risks, you know, maybe risks that you I identified and you appreciate, but they're going unmitigated because you just don't have enough hours in the day to go through and, and figure out, you know, what are we going to do about this? So it just kind of falls under the back burner. Um, those are the big red flags for me, or if there's maybe red flags that are being generated that aren't getting a really full and thorough evaluation, um, you know, then, then you might have a problem. Uh, I would start again with your risk assessment, um, kind of look through the risks you've identified. And if you don't feel like you're able to appropriately mitigate that with your staff, then then I would go to management and say, hey, look, we may have a problem here. What do you know about the pace of the new priority releases FinCEN plans to pump out as part of their new plan? Yeah, it seems like FinCEN's going to go with the, there's a there's a four year um, you know mandate that's in, in the reg, and that that's probably what they'll go with. They could do it on a more frequent basis, or you know it, it, that that's perfectly possible. Um, it's a, it's going to be a burden for them to make sure that they're updating it and you know kind of balancing out the logic behind all of their priorities. Um, but uh, and it's also going to be a burden on on you to make sure that you're updating it. Uh, spoiler alert: that new proposed rule is going to mandate that you take these into account as part of your uh, newly mandated risk assessment process. Um, so again, this is going to be something that they have to make sure they're keeping up with. You're going to have to keep up with. Um, and but it, but it looks like it's probably going to be at least every four years. When we have CIP discrepancies, such as an address, do we need some type of physical document to resolve it, or can we rely on an individual's explanation, such as them saying they moved? Can our program allow either method to resolve the discrepancy? You're you're given some flexibility to document what the resolution of the disparity needs to look like. Um, you just need to have documentation in your file that that demonstrates that it was resolved effectively. Um, so you do have some flexibility there. Uh, you, I, I would say, you know, if it's just a verb, if it's just a checkbox or something like that, you might get some criticism because it does, you know, they, especially if it looks like people are just checking that box as a matter of course, without really doing any kind of investigation or thought. Um, I would say whatever process you have now, audit it, Make sure it's working as intended, and if you run into problems, then maybe you might want to tweak it and add additional steps. Can our program allow for a copy of a driver's license be mailed to us for verification purposes? Okay, so let's under CIP. There's there's two ways that you can go through the verification process. There's there's documentary, and that's where you you look at the physical, uh, you know, government issued ID. Uh, and it's got to be unexpired. And, and so that's that's one process you can go through. Um, but really, you can't have that copy mailed into you under normal CIP. But also remember, there's a non-documentary process that you can come up with. So if you have customers who can't get you that, uh, you know, that, that don't, either don't have the ID or something along those lines, you have flexibility to design a non-documentary process. And, and I could see where the copy of that unexpired ID um, would be could be part of your non-documentary process. Um, I just wouldn't. I think it would be sufficient if you were just going to get that copy and, and that was all you're going to do. You need to, um, you know, kind of bolster it with whatever process you're going to go through to make sure that they are that you're comfortable or you've developed that reasonable belief that they are who they say they are. On a phase two CTR exemption. How can we demonstrate that less than 50% of revenue is from any ineligible activities? Can we just ask the customer? Now, you're given flexibility, and there isn't anything that says specifically how you have to get that information every year. Um, you can ask, but, but think about how you're going to document that going forward. You know, if you just pick up the telephone and you say, you know, hey, customer, are, do you still meet the qualifications for phase two CTRs? And they say yes. Um, and then you hang up. There's not going to be a lot of documentation there. So I, I don't see just just asking them very often when I go into financial institutions. 
Uh, generally, it, it's a little more comfortable if you actually have some documentation, like a written attestation or or, or something more concrete than that to, to really demonstrate that she went through that process. So, uh, but again, there isn't anything that mandates how you have to do it. Um, you, you, I, I would just say that, that that conversation might not be real thorough documentation. So, If a SAR involves activity from more than one FinCEN advisory, such as pig butchering and elder financial exploitation, are both provided in the filing institution note field? You know, nothing in the uh, directions, even references having multiple, uh, you know, alerts that you can that you would reference there. But uh, back in in during COVID, if you remember in, in, in COVID, when we were getting all of those alerts from FinCEN that were all COVID related, uh, they they did have some guidance where they where they say it's OK or they 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 do say that you can list multiple ID numbers, uh, you know, in, in that field. So I, you know, in the absence of direction saying you have to, uh, there is that guidance out there that says you can. So uh, if you think it's helpful and you think that uh, it will, it will, you know, increase the benefit, the, the value of that SAR, then by all means, there's nothing that says you can. We have an exam scheduled later this year, and we've been told the BSA portion will be remote. How do institutions handle getting such sensitive information, such as SARS, to examiners and auditors? Yeah, generally, I would say whoever your examiner and auditor is, you need to coordinate with them and, and make sure whatever means you use uh, that 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 it's kind of acceptable on both both ends. Um, generally, um, I, I think we're we're pretty good at setting up some secure uh, you know pathways for that kind of information to go through. I know when we do it, um, we have a secure um, platform where that can be submitted. Um, but in doubt, uh, you know, oftentimes it could be something, well, we're going to we're going to reserve this for the on site portion just because we're concerned about it. But uh, I would say it, it kind of depends on who your auditor is and who your examiners are. Um, just coordinate with them and make sure that it's comfortable for both sides. Under current beneficial owner rules, do I Ulta accounts require beneficial ownership? Would we only identify a controlling agent and not actual owners? Okay, so um, there's there's guidance out there to this effect, but uh, you know if you if you think about it from a CIP perspective, uh, you know an IOLTA account is um, you know it is it is being opened by either the lawyer or law firm. Okay, so under CIP, if that you know if it's a legal entity that's opening that account. Uh, then you have to get the beneficial owner information for that legal entity. So if it's a if it's a law firm, then yes, you would get the beneficial owner. But again, it's for that law firm itself. Um, you know, if it's if it's just an attorney, then maybe you might not. But for the most part, most point, we see the beneficial owner information even on an IOLTA account it is for um, whoever the that account is open for. Now you're going to get information potentially about the uh, you know who you know who that what those transactions are for. Um, but that would be under the customer risk profile. It wouldn't necessarily be something you would need on that beneficial owner form. Um, these next couple take us back to CTR filings. If we have an MSB customer who begins using an armored car service, how do we report this on CTRs? Are we required to report on the conductor? Okay, so there, there's, uh, I believe it's an FAQ that comes out on this, and, and, and basically what it says, so you have a privately hired armored car service. Um, first off, you're going to aggregate those deposits on a customer level, so you don't, don't change anything there. But on the CTR, you're going to complete the armored car service as an additional part one, and you'll, you know, you'll have a, 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 that 2D box. Uh, but you do not include the individual driver or, or employee, so it will be the service itself. And so there'll be two part ones there. Uh, item 20 requests the form of identi identification used to verify identity. In addition to the type of form, it requests the number, the country, and the issuing state to be listed. If we use the articles of incorporation as identification, would the number be the business identification number of the entity which is on the articles? Or is this referring to a different number? Oh, well, see, it's a little fuzzy. So they do want a number 
from the document that you use to verify their identity. But since this is a legal entity, it's not like it's a driver's license. Uh, now, the, the problem is, is, you know, every state uh, has a little bit different process. And you may even be looking at different types of documents under that process, uh, under, you know, how you're doing that, uh, your, your CIP process. Um, so it might be a little bit different. Typically, what they're looking for, though, is that identification number. Um, so it could be that business identification number. If, if your state or, or your practice in your areas, that's what, you know, is, is common. Uh, but a lot of states, they don't have that as a standard number on any of these, these documents. Uh, so uh, the, the recommendation has been is if it doesn't have one of those numbers or those standard numbers that are out there to ID the document itself, uh, to find just any number that ha that is on it as well and include that in the field. Uh, remember, they're, you know, high level, we're connecting the dots on different entities. And so even if there isn't that business identification number, any number that's on there might be helpful to help them track some of this information from behind the scenes. So how about a NICS code for an individual? Would there be no NICS code because it's not a business or would you use the code of the individual's occupation? Yeah, if you use the NICS code, uh, then you could use it for the individual and their occupation. So, Can you address what, if any, actions you would recommend financial institutions take now in response to FinCEN's proposed rule on CTF and AML programs? Okay, so there's this proposed rule is out there. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be, you know, it's going to require several different several changes to your program. Uh, they're, they're formalizing some things that uh, weren't a requirement before. In fact, if you have attended any of our trainings, I've, I've often said that, you know, well, we've got these, you know, the pillars of your program but it's all driven by your risk assessment. There isn't a regulation or a law out there that says you must have a risk assessment. It's just how we get, get this all done. Um, that's going to change if the proposal is adopted as it's been kind of laid out. There is now going to be a requirement that you have a risk assessment. There's also going to be a few other things that are, that are updated. Um, in fact, uh, you may have heard the term CFT or, you know, countering the financing of terrorism. Now, that might be confusing to some of you because it was CTF in years past, or if, you, if you've done any research, like other countries call it CTF, meaning basically the same thing. But we're leaning now into the acronym CFT. So you may have some program changes. You need to have an AML CFT program. And so there's going to be some cosmetic changes there as well. Uh, but also, like I mentioned before, um, we're going to be addressing, you know, the the priorities uh, that uh, that the, the government is putting together. And on, on, you know, at least every four years, they're going to be updating those priorities. And we're going to be looking at those and incorporating them into our risk assessment. So, uh, I, again, the, a few of those things you might want to start sprinkling in that uh, that that acronym into your program. Um, you definitely might want to start taking a look at those priority or priorities and documenting your response to that. Um, if you don't have a risk assessment, make sure you have your risk assessment and that you understand how it's going to be working to drive your program into the future. But uh, on that note, and, and I see Jared's brought up the, uh, you know, the, the slide to kind of, you know, cue me off for this. Um, we're going to talk about the new proposal and and all of the moving parts, really, for the next, uh, you know, over the last year and then kind of crystal balling looking into the forward, uh, looking forward into the future at the um, the virtual BSA conference. So in that one day process, we're going to go through all of this. We're going to talk about uh, not just what we have on our plate now, um, but also look at, OK, what types of things might you want to be doing now? to position yourself for changes that we know are on their way. And, and here's the thing. Um, it's not just beneficial owner and it's not just this new proposed rule. There are several other changes that they are working on all out of that BSA AML reform that was passed at the very tail end of 2020. There's going to be a lot of things that are moving through. So, so the key now is to make sure that you've positioned yourself to be ready for that change. So uh, with that, I suppose, Jared, uh, I'll, I'll let you chime in. I see you popped up. So, <laughs> Well, first off, I want to commend both you and uh, Diane. Uh, great job. Um, I, I had a mark. I was trying to keep track somewhere between 45 and 50 different questions. And I know a lot of them were two and three parts. So my math could be a little bit under. 
Uh, but great job getting all those questions. Hopefully, uh, the audience has found value. I know we jumped around a lot. They tried to get to a lot of different things, uh, a lot of great questions coming into today. I do want to remind everybody that the session is recorded. Uh, we will turn that around and get it back to all of you within the next two weeks so you can go back and listen to it again. Pause, rewind, fast forward, uh, whatever it is uh, to, to benefit you and your teammates. Uh, I also, as we got about a minute here before we send you back uh, to, to your to your daily missions, uh, I want to mention the the next version of the forum and let you all know that you can get your team signed up immediately for that. So the next one, the, the fourth quarter version, is a little bit different than the first three that we do each year. The first three are Q&A, just like what Kevin and Diane did today. The fourth one is called A Look Back and What Lies Ahead. Essentially, it's taking uh, the year in review and saying, all right, what was the headline news and making sure all of you didn't miss something. Okay, I mean, there's a lot going on and sometimes things fall through the cracks. We want this to be kind of a, a, a you know a safeguard that says, oh, yeah, I got I to gotta remember to go back and take care of that or I missed that completely. And it's BSA, it's lending, it's deposit compliance all wrapped into one and just kind of a quick hit. We also take a, a, a snapshot into what's up on the horizon and say, all right, Here's some information to feed to your boards, to your management teams to say, all right, here's what's coming. Okay, it's it's the fourth quarter, so it's great. It's going to help you with your budgets, with your resources for the coming year and say, all right, here's what's coming. Here's what we might need. Okay, and we always need more people, more resources, more things, right? But it might help you as you prepare for that year ahead. So again, thank you team. And all of you that were working behind the scenes, Amy Kay, I know you were doing a ton behind the scenes, Kyla Kroger, Emily for helping out as well. And anybody else I may have missed great job team uh, with today's program. In closing, just a couple of things here before we send you all on your way. And Kevin, I'm going to give you a, a chance to close out here too as well. But there's a short survey, five questions. Uh, give us a little feedback on how we did today. It won't take you long. It'll take you less than 60 seconds here. And then, Kevin, I'm going to let you uh, do some parting shots here, if you will, and then we'll, we'll close out so everybody can get back to doing what they all do best. All right. Well, I just wanted to thank everybody for all of the questions and your time and, and really on that survey, particularly when it gets to if there are other types of training that you might be interested in. Uh, we do read through those. And, and if there's something you have a particular itch that needs scratch or you need uh, something that's specific for your team, let us know or reach out to us because uh, we, we do try to customize a lot of these trainings. All right. Well, I think we'll let everybody get back to their, their daily routines here. Thanks again, and we'll see you all again soon.